Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. My name is Alison, the online piano and the online violin tutor. In today's video, I want to talk to you about six different ways that you can avoid hitting other strings on your violin. And that kind of goes hand in hand with um, being a bit scratchy on the violin. Hitting other strings scratchy is pretty much to me um, more or less the same same sort of thing. If you're hitting other strings, you're gonna be scratchy. If you're sounding scratchy, you're kind of hitting other strings. So I want to give you six reasons that you might be hitting other strings, and hopefully it will help you in stopping hitting those other, str those other strings, and just help kind of shed a little bit of light onto why you're hitting those other strings. As a newbie violinist, I think hitting other strings is probably just the single most annoying thing I think you can do as a player. I, I mean, if I, if I had a pound for every time somebody wrote a comment underneath one of my YouTube videos, I certainly wouldn't be sitting here making videos. I'd be off on my, my massive boat and floating around in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. It's, it's probably the number one comment that I get. Why do I sound scratchy? Why am I hitting other strings, etc., etc. So I've got six, six reasons or six ways that you can help to stop hit those strings. But before I go any further, I just want to um, do a little bit of housekeeping and just, just let you know that I do have a one to 30 violin course. I'll have a link coming up in a card. I always forget which corner it is, this one or this one, but I'll have a little card coming up um, with a video about that. But I have written a book series with 30 violin lessons and they come with interactive videos as well. So my course is a very traditional course. It will take you from a complete, absolute beginner, you know nothing about nothing about the violin to a very accomplished decent intermediate violin player and as I say I'm a classically trained violinist so I suppose I teach more of the traditional method but there is nothing like my course anywhere on the internet nobody has done anything like this similarly and this is those lessons are just mainly the what 20 years of experience of of teaching students here at my home over the years um, you know, and, and just just my, my my years of just musical experience, really, and, and teaching. And what I've done is just put my teaching method into a book, made the interactive videos that go along with it, and you know, made them all available to you guys on the internet. And it is a 100% downloadable course. So the second you 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 pay. Um, you can you get access to download the books and you can kick off immediately. So I will put a link to that as well, but it's a one to 30 violin course, takes you from, guarantees to take you from, I know that's a bold statement, but I absolutely stand by that. It guarantees to take you from a complete beginner to a, a, a very decent, accomplished, intermediate violin player. And the other thing I wanted to talk to you about as well is, did you know I have a Patreon page? I don't think a lot of you know that I have a Patreon page. I always have like little tags coming up at the beginning of the video, but I don't really think, you know, I don't think people kind of put two and two together with that. So I do have a Patreon page um, that has been going now for, oh, a good, maybe, maybe a good three, three and a bit years now. Um, and on there I, I post, um, I make arrangements of violin sheet music. There is a little bit of piano sheet music on there as well. There is some blogs on there that I've written about various things that accompany videos. All of the content that is on my Patreon page is exclusive to Patreon. Whatever you see on Patreon is not anywhere else. I just wanna make that clear. So for those of you that are pledging on Patreon, you can rest assured that this information isn't just kind of floating about the internet somewhere. Whatever goes on Patreon stays on Patreon. I have a back catalog there of, last time I checked just this morning, of about 800 pieces of violin music for you to instantly kind of get your hands on and download. There's some backing tracks on there as well, so I do upload quite a few backing tracks that accompany the sheet music as well if you if you want those. So depending on how much you pledge per month will depend on what, what benefits you get. But if you check it out, I'll put a link to my Patreon underneath as well. But I just thought that it might be interesting for you to know that I had a Patreon page as well. Okay, so let's get on to the actual video. So the first reason that people hit strings is basically the angle of the bow. And this is just something that is just, 
it, it, it's just so it's something that's so simple but I think people just don't really kind of relate it or, or put the two together so it's going to be the angle of the bow this does kind of stem off into a few other reasons and I will talk about those later on in this video so you need to think about the angles of the bow and this this is very simple I've done many videos on this I've actually got a post on this on patreon as well I'll link the actual post down uh, down below where I'm actually talking about this but it's a it's a video um, and it's a blog post where I'm, I'm, I'm going into more depth about it as well but it's about the angle of the bow and this is all about this part of the arm here so if you start at the G string you know that your arm will need to be around about here so for me that's kind of what more or less just chin level not too high I know it's too high because it's covering my face but just more or less chin level the D string is about there the A string is a bit about there sorry I think that I'm probably just going to come off screen here and the E string is about there so you've got the four different levels of your arm right there so you just need to make sure that your arm is working in level so if you think of your arm as being like an elevator or a lift and if the lift is going up and down and it doesn't stop at the at, at the correct junctures for where the you know the each each level or each floor is when the doors open up the lift is going to sort of be halfway there so you won't be able to get in you won't be able to get out so you want to make sure that your arm is literally like an elevator or a lift and that it is stopping at the exact stops so E string, A string, D string, G string, D string, A string, E string. So that's where you need to be. So like I say, I've, I've got a little exercise that I've, I've already written about and I've already put on patrons. So if you wanna go and check that out, I'll link that underneath. But it's just basically. So it's just about getting that arm angle. So if your arm is kind of, and I don't know if I can do this or not, but if your arm, your G string is there and your arm is supposed to be there for the D string, but you're there, there you go. So you can hit both of those strings there. So um, I, I think that's what's happening when people are hitting other strings, their arm is just not at the right level. It's kind of somewhere in between that. If you are in between say the A string and the D string, so the A string is there, the D string is there, and if I were to be roughly there, then I'm gonna be playing both strings at the same time. So that is something that, that you learn as, a, as an advanced technique anyway, but once you've learned the different angles of the strings and then you're more advanced, you can actually learn to hit, hit two strings or double stop and, and hit those two strings as well. But what's happening is that you're not keeping your arm you know, you're kind of doing that so your arm isn't actually staying at that level and that's really actually goes back a little bit further as well when you're actually bowing you're not ever bowing you know from from the top of your shoulder here you're always bowing from the elbow so when you think how you're bowing so remember I said it was all about the level of this arm here and then once your arm is at the correct level you can see that everything is just moving from that elbow nothing else is actually moving anywhere so that is the the angle of the bow and that is probably the biggest reason why people hit other strings so moving on to number two and this is probably more about scratch and that is using too much rosin and the wrong kind of rosin now I made a video uh, what about a month ago or so if I can remember I'll link it underneath but if you go back on my channel it was literally only about two three maybe four videos ago that I made a video about rosin and talking all about rosin and I went in went to quite depth about um, different types of rosins and things like that so Cheaper rosins are are, are are the enemy, you know, the cheaper rosins are, are the devil for the violin. So the, the rosins that you get in your case, let's say you've got a cheap student violin, maybe, you know, $100, $200, $150, something like that. And you just get the kind of the, the, the block of cheap, crappy rosin that you get in there. First thing I always say, the first thing I recommend is that you toss that rosin in the bin and you go and get yourself something de decent. So obviously if you don't have anything decent to straight away, then don't toss it in the bin, use it. Otherwise you're not gonna be able to get, get your violin off and running, are you? But in, if you can get hold of a better quality rosin, then you're gonna have so much more of, of an easier life just because you've got better rosin. Who'd have thought that by getting a decent rosin is gonna eliminate scratch? 
you just wouldn't even put two and two together. But I promise you, it does. Those rosins are just very, um, they're milled very, the only way I can kind of describe it is, for example, the difference between sugar, um, actual sugar that you put in your, your tea on your coffee, and caster sugar. I don't know if you guys in the US call it kind of sugar. I think you have different names for it. Powdered sugar might be icing sugar, but the sugar granules um, that you put in your tea and coffee and the caster sugar, which is the finer version of that that you put into baking, that you bake cakes with. So if you imagine your, your cheaper rosin to be like the sugar that you put in your tea and coffee, so it's quite granulated, and then you compare the better rosins to something more like caster sugar, where it's a lot finer, it's a lot more finely ground. And that is going to make a huge difference on your bow because you're gonna get less fallout, you're gonna get less dust, it's gonna be less sticky, it's gonna be high quality. Um, the thicker, the, the, the stickier and the grittier it is, the worse it's gonna be on your violin. Then you compare that to people putting too much rosin on their bow as well, and you've just got a recipe for disaster there, quite literally. So go and check out that video. I'll link it underneath. I can't put a link here. I'll link that video underneath. So go and go, I, I urge you to go and check that out because it will just make more sense of what I'm talking about here. And I don't want to repeat everything I've just said in that video. So just make sure you don't have too much rosin and make sure you've got a good quality rosin because that will cause a lot of scratch on the violin. Trust me, thank me later. You're welcome. Okay, the third reason is posture. Now, this this drives me mad when I'm teaching, but posture has just so many consequences, not just for hitting other strings, but for just for everything else as well, and just playing in general. So I see a lot of students just playing down like this. It drives me mad. I see a lot of students playing down like this. They're just, you know, they're just everywhere they shouldn't be. Now, again, I've got a video on exactly how to hold the violin and how to work out how to hold it. And I made that again about a month or so ago. So I will link that directly underneath this video as well. If you want to go and check that out, because I'm just going to talk very, very briefly about it. But your posture makes a huge difference because if your violin is down here, for example, should never be down there. How on earth are you supposed to get the level of your arm correct if your violin isn't there? Your number one that we talked about where your arm is gonna be at a certain level, um, if your violin, that only works if your violin is where it should be. And obviously I know where my violin should be because I've been playing for many, many years. But if my violin is not where it should be, then I can't do this. So these are the levels that my violin needs to, uh, sorry, that the bow needs to be at. If my violin is down there, can you see instantly what happens it's kind of like my my wrist kind of goes a bit introvert, and now I, everything's just all kind of crunched in together. It just it just doesn't look right, does it? You can see it doesn't look right on the video when I'm kind of when I'm doing all of that. So how on earth can you possibly get the angle when your shoulder is immediately raised up, the wrist is all crunched up, and that's going to affect the bow hold if your bow hold is wrong. It just creates a whole knock-on effect and a whole ripple effect for a whole host of other other problems as well. So I think actually, you know, as, as we kind of get more into this, hitting strings is really just the tip of the iceberg, but everything stems off from everything and it's kind of putting together that, that big picture. So make sure your violin is in the right place. And again, um, I'll link that video underneath so you can go and check that out and make sure that your violin is in the right place. You can check out the blog post that I've written on Patreon about how to kind of, you know, level your arm. And then that's, that's kind of gonna go hand in hand with the level. So if the posture's not there, then you're definitely gonna hit strings and you're not gonna be able to get your arm in the correct level that it should be. Okay, number four, the angle of the bridge. Very, very important, but I feel this is something um, that could potentially be described as being out of a lot of people's hands. So when you buy these cheaper violins, the bridges are, the, the, the bridges are not correct. They're not as they should be. And that's kind of, that's too bad really, because, you know, not having a correct bridge or a correctly angled bridge, I'll show you mine, is basically the, the, the be all and end all. So if you, if you have too much of a flat bridge, then it doesn't matter how well you angle your arm, 
it's it's just futile really you're just fighting a losing battle because your bridge is never going to give that to you so this is why i always recommend don't buy cheap violins you just don't buy cheap violins for, for just the obvious reasons anyway, but mainly because you're going to hit other strings. I absolutely guarantee you will hit other strings because you are playing on a cheap violin. That then kind of spirals off into a whole host of other situations where you are hitting other strings. So then you don't practice as much and you get really frustrated and you don't like it. And then you give up the violin. You think it's all because of you being a failure, but it's not. It's because of the cheap violin that you've bought in the first place. Yet, I understand that you don't want to spend a lot of money and you want to buy something cheap just to dip your toe in the water to see if you like it. But it kind of puts you in a bit of a, you know, a, a, a bit of a catch-22 situation where the violin's not very good, you're hitting all the other strings, you don't like it, you don't practice it, you think, oh, the violin's rubbish. You know, and it's, it's not that, it's just simply because you bought something too cheap in the first place. So the other option would be is to go and get a bridge fitted, but the downside to that is that you have to get them fitted professionally. You can't just buy a bridge that is curved and poof, put it in your violin and it'll just fit your violin. Even though violins look the same, they are absolutely not the same because the string action is different as in the height of the strings from the body of the violin. The body of the violin is very slightly different. The fingerboard is very slight. Every single violin is very slightly different. So if I took my bridge, I posted it to you, you put it on your violin, I guarantee it wouldn't work because your string action might be higher or lower than, than mine. So then you'd have to go and get this bridge fitted. That can be counterintuitive and quite cost prohibitive to do that. So you could be looking at paying someone two, three hundred dollars just to fit a bridge to your violin that you only paid fifty dollars for. So this is why it is very crucial that you do buy a good quality violin because otherwise there's no other way that you're going to get a decent bridge in there. So if you look and see how curved my violin bridge is, it's quite curved. I specifically had that made for me when I bought this, the, the E string wasn't low enough. So I had my violin luthier take it down a little bit further for me. So that, that just kind of suited the style of playing. So your bridge is gonna be a main one. So so look at that. And you know, as I, as I say, if you, the only real way to kind of test that is to play on a much better violin and see if you have any of those, you know, those, those hitting, string hitting situations. Okay, number five, the wrist angle. So your wrist angle is really important. So what you wanna do is make sure that your wrist, this part of your wrist here is always higher than the bow. So what you want to do when you're grabbing the bow is kind of just, have your arm up like this, you drop your wrist down, so your fingers are just nice and relaxed, and then you should just be able to just grab hold of the bow with your fingers kind of hanging down. That's how you should be. So your wrist should always be in line with your, your elbow and then your hand. The bow should definitely be further down. The bow should never be up at the same level because as soon as you do that, you can see my fingers are now kind of flat. So what we want is the fingers to be down. So really you want a nice long line between your elbow, your wrist, and the kind of the top of your knuckles. Or slightly, maybe slightly sort of going down at a, a, you know, a, a slight angle. But you definitely want your fingers hanging down and you definitely want your bow down. A lot of people, a lot of people kind of, a lot of people bow that way. That's definitely not the right way you should bow. Because if you're bowing that way, you can't get the angle because you, you just simply don't have enough control over it. And again, you know, that's just, you're not gonna get the levels because you're just holding it wrong. So this is a very common bow hold where people have everything down and their bow is definitely higher than their wrist or the knuckles, the wrist and the elbow. So we want everything up. So can you see instantly the difference is, is that as soon as I raise that elbow up, you can see that my fingers just want to hang down. And then again, that fits with posture. So because my, my wrist is up and my bow angle is correct, so it all goes hand in hand. So if I've got everything down like that, I, I literally can't even figure out the levels of my arm and then my shoulders going up. So it kind of all stems, it, it all sort of stems from everything.
the last one, number six, would be the actual kind of instrument itself, so the violin. So again, it kind of like goes a little bit um, to what I was speaking about with, um, with number four, about the angle of the bridge, and that kind of does go hand in hand with the actual violin itself really so it's not quite just about the bridge but it's the way the tail pieces uh the way it all fits in with the pegs just generally the way the instrument has been made so suffice to say that if you do have a cheaper violin then you know ev everything about it isn't just going to be set up so it will just be a kind of wooden violin shaped object with just a, f a few of the things and accessories that go on the violin like the strings and the pegs and and the bridge and the tailpiece and the chin rest etc but it isn't going to be it isn't going to be well made at all because you're just not going to be paying that kind of money for that to kind of happen with so there we go thank you very much for watching this video i hope this has helped you and i hope you can take all those those bits and bobs on board don't forget to check out my 1 to 30 violin lesson it really is um a, a really really good course and i know <laughs> i know i'm plugging it a bit um but you know i'm, I'm really proud of that course you can just check Check out the reviews on my website as well and see what other people are saying about it. If you've bought the course or you've bought some of my books from that course, then please do leave a comment underneath this video, um, you know, giving me your feedback and others can read that as well. But it is a really, really good course and it does take you from a complete beginner to a very decent accomplished intermediate. And also don't forget to check out my Patreon page as well, where I'm always putting um, sheet music arranged for violin. As I said, there's nearly 800 pieces of sheet music there depending on how much you pledge per month will depend on what benefits um, that, that, that you get from my patreon page and i will leave all the links to, to everything underneath this video so thank you very much for watching and i will see you in my next video bye